Good morning, Glenkirk Church friends and family and guests uh, throughout our community and around the world who are uh, tuning in to us live or who are watching the, um, the broadcast of this. Um, welcome today. Um, I'd like to start today with a couple of quick stories. And the first story is about my friend David. I met David when I was in my early 20s, and we were both students doing our general ed requirements at Chafee Community College in Rancho Cucamonga. Both David and I wanted to study at Christian colleges so we could pursue degrees in theology, and so we were going to community college to get ready to transfer in, and David's dream was to transfer to a very well-known Christian college located in the Midwest. So um, as David got closer to finishing his gen ed requirements, he flew to this college to do a admissions visit. And during his visit, David discovered that this particular college had a rule. The rule was that students weren't allowed to have any facial hair. And David had a full beard. Now, it's not that David was unwilling to shave his beard. It's that he couldn't understand the reason why the college would have that rule in the first place. In fact, as he sat in the admissions office waiting for his appointment, he saw a portrait of the college's founder on the wall with a full beard. But they were adamant about this rule. No facial hair of any kind. And David, not just for that reason, but for a variety of different reasons, not to attend his dream college. Story number two. Let me tell you about my friends who I'll call Jay and Janice. During my senior year as a Bible major at Biola University, uh, I was in a small group Bible study with Jay and Janice. And one night I told Jay and Janice about how my Greek classes were helping me study the Bible. And Jay and Janice used that opportunity to tell me that they had grown very worried about me studying Greek. They were worried that it was going to corrupt my faith. Because you see, Jay and Janice believed that the King James Version of the Bible was the only true Bible. They believed that all the other Bible translations were part of a conspiracy to lure Christians away from their faith in Jesus. You see, it wasn't merely that Jay and Janice preferred the King James because they liked it. They saw it as a requirement to be a real Christian. Story number three. At the first church that I was a senior pastor at, one of the small groups in our church decided to do a Bible study on the Jewish practices in the Old Testament law. They, they thought that understanding these practices and studying them would help them understand Jesus better since Jesus was Jewish. But over time, the members of this small group became convinced that God still requires Christians today to observe all the Old Testament Sabbath laws and all the food laws. In fact, they wrote up a proposal urging us as pastors and elders at that church to move our worship services from Sunday mornings to Saturdays in order to observe the Old Testament Sabbath laws. And again, it's not just that they preferred worshiping on Saturday. They were convinced that God required it. And when we didn't change our services, the members of this group left our church to start their own church to worship on Saturday. Now, each of these stories demonstrates how easy it can be to turn our own personal preferences and convictions into rules Rules that we use to judge other people. And when our preferences become rules, these rules become what some social scientists call social boundary markers. Social boundary markers are symbols, visible symbols that are used to determine who's in a group and who's out of a group. For example, several years ago, I rode my motorcycle a couple of times with a Christian motorcycle club in Riverside. This group would meet once a month for breakfast, Bible study, and then all go on a group ride together. And the couple of times that I went, they welcomed me as a guest, but it was very clear that I was a guest and not a member. 
because I didn't have a patch with the name of the motorcycle club and its chapter sewn on the back of my motorcycle jacket. That patch served as a boundary marker, a symbol to indicate who was in the club and who wasn't. And in all three of the stories I shared, Christians created their own boundary markers to determine who was in and who was out. Personal preferences that are turned into rules become boundary markers that we use to judge who's in the church and who's not. Now, we've been in through a series through Paul's letter to the Colossian church that we've called Above All. And in this series, we've seen that Jesus Christ is truly Lord above all things and that our lives, no matter what the chaos around us, are safe and secure under His powerful Lordship. And the passage we're going to look at today gives us a window into a big problem that was growing in the Colossian church. And this big problem involved personal preferences that had turned into rules that were being used to judge who was in and who was out. Now, today's message is going to be a little different because I'm actually going to lead us in a Bible study practice that is sometimes called mirror reading. In mirror reading, we look at what Paul says in response to a problem and use that as a mirror to reconstruct and figure out what the problem actually was in the first place. And so that's what we're going to do today in Colossians 2 verses 16 through 23. So let's look at the passage together. Colossians 2 beginning in verse 16. Do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink or with regard to a religious festival, a new moon celebration, or a Sabbath day. These are a shadow of the things that were to come. The reality, however, is found in Christ. Do not let anyone who delights in false humility and the worship of angels disqualify you. Such a person also goes into great detail about what they have seen, they are puffed up with idle notions of their unspiritual mind. They have lost connection with the head from whom the whole body, supported and held together by its ligaments and sinews, grows as God causes it to grow. Since you died with Christ to the elemental spiritual forces of this world, why, as though you still belong to the world, do you submit to its rules? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. These rules, which have to do with things that are all destined to perish with use, are based on merely human commandments and teachings. Such regulations indeed have an appearance of wisdom with their self-imposed worship, their false humility, and their harsh treatment of the body, but they lack any value in restraining sensual desires." Let's start by focusing on the two commands in this section. In verse 16, do not let anyone judge you. And in verse 18, do not let anyone disqualify you. This technique of mirror reading would say that because Paul issues these two commands, it implies that people were judging the Colossian church and were disqualifying the members of the Colossian church. And we've already seen hints of this in Colossians. Most likely, this was a group of Jewish Christians from outside of the city of Colossae who had arrived into the city and who were stirring up problems. This group's judgment of the Colossians went beyond mere criticism, which would have been bad enough, but it was a judgment. Bible scholar N.T. Wright says that this group was telling the Colossian Christians that they weren't yet truly part of the people of God, that they weren't yet true Christians. And the word disqualify in verse 18 was actually an athletic term. This word was used in the ancient Olympics in Greece when a referee would disqualify an athlete for breaking the rules. 
This group of Jewish Christians appointed themselves as spiritual referees over the Colossian church, disqualifying them from being real Christians because they weren't following this particular group's rules. So what were these rules? Well, there are some do's and there were some don'ts. So let's start with the do's. One of the rules was observance of the Jewish calendar. Observance of the Jewish calendar. The religious festivals, new moons, and Sabbaths in verse 16 refer to holy days in the Jewish calendar. And it's not like this group was saying, hey, you should join us for a Passover dinner so you can learn about how Jesus fulfills the Passover. That would have been fine. But this group was making the Jewish calendar a requirement, a rule, a boundary marker that determined who was in and who was out. The festivals were the annual celebrations like Passover and the Day of Atonement. The new moons were the, the monthly celebrations and the Sabbaths were the weekly observances. Another do was participation in angelic worship. Verse 18 talks about delighting in the worship of angels. And I think it's likely that this group was actually, I, I think it's unlikely that this group was actually worshiping angels as if the angels were gods. I think it's more likely that the worship of angels describes a particular kind of worship that this group talked about. The kind of worship that the angels of God worshiped God with. In other words, this group was saying that the Colossian church's worship wasn't good enough. This group was judging the Colossian church as disqualified because their worship services didn't fit this group's self-made rules about what worship should be like. Finally, a third do was harshly disciplining the body with fasting. Harshly disciplining the body with fasting. We see this, the word humility in verse 18 was often used to describe fasting, which was a sign of humility. And, and fasting in the Bible, it's not dieting. It's not abstaining from certain kinds of food for health reasons. Fasting is abstaining from food for spiritual reasons. And I think verse 23 suggests that this fasting was extremely rigorous because it involved harsh treatment of the body. Now, fasting is not bad. There are times to fast. It's a spiritual discipline or practice. We often fast during the season of Lent. Jesus taught about fasting. But this group required it, and they required rigorous fasting, turning a helpful spiritual practice that can be life-giving into a required rule, a social boundary marker, to determine who is in and who is out. We also find some don'ts in these verses, practices that were forbidden. Don't do these things. One don't in verse 16 was eating certain foods. Don't eat certain foods. And Jewish people divided food into two categories, clean, or the Hebrew word is kosher, and unclean. Beef tacos were clean. Carnitas tacos were unclean. Chicken Alfredo was clean. Shrimp scampi was unclean. I'm starting to get hungry doing this. Jesus and the apostles taught that the food laws, these food laws, were no longer required for Christians. But this group insisted that they were. And like my first church, the people in my first church in that small group, this group said that eating certain foods disqualified you from being a real Christian. Another don't from verse 17 was drinking certain beverages. Drinking certain beverages. And the Old Testament, it doesn't divide drinks into clean and unclean categories like it does with food. And so I think that the don't in verse 16 related to drinking alcohol. You see, most people in the ancient world, including most Jewish people, drank beer and wine with their rule or with their meals in moderation. Although getting drunk was viewed as sinful, 
Drinking in moderation was viewed as okay. After all, Jesus' first miracle was not turning water into welches. It was turning water into wine. But there were a handful of Jewish groups back then who taught that true believers would completely abstain from alcohol. And it's likely that this group in Colossae was one of those groups, and they were telling the Colossian church that drinking alcohol, even in moderation, disqualified them from being true Christians. Now, there are some good reasons why a Christian might decide to abstain from alcohol. If you've had a drinking problem in the past, or if you're in recovery, abstaining is a good idea. If alcoholism runs in your family, or if you live with someone who has a drinking problem, it might be wise for you to abstain. But this group was turning it into a rule, a boundary marker that was used to judge who is in and who is out. Finally, the last don't was engaging in marital intimacy. Marital intimacy. And this one is a little less clear, but I think it's implied in between a husband and wife in marriage. And there were a handful of Jewish groups back then that required their members to be single or if they were already married to leave their spouse before they could join their group. For example, the group associated with the Dead Sea Scrolls would not allow married people to join their group and once you joined you couldn't get married. No wonder that group died out. So it's likely that this group was telling the Colossian Christians that it If they were married, they weren't true Christians unless they left their spouse. Now, why in the world would these rules be so tempting to the Colossians? What would make this list of do's and don'ts appealing? Well, again, I think our mirror reading reveals some promises that this group was making to the Colossian Christians that would make these rules appealing. This group was promising that these rules would guarantee that the Colossians fully belonged to the people of God, that they really belonged to God's people. And of course, the Colossian Christians wanted to fully belong. I mentioned a couple of weeks ago in our series that there was a small but vocal group of Jewish Christians who believed that non-Jewish Christians, like the Colossians, should fully adopt a fully Jewish way of life and culture before the church should welcome them in to the people of God. And the Colossians wanted to belong. That's why they trusted Jesus in the first place. It's why they left their old way of life behind with its moral confusion, its captivity to sin, its fear and hopelessness. But then along comes this group that says believing in Jesus and being baptized isn't enough. If you really want to make sure you belong, follow these rules. I think this group was also promising that these rules would give the Colossian Christians mystical spiritual visions. In verse 18, Paul says that this group of people would go into great detail about what they had seen. N.T. Wright and other Bible scholars say that this is describing a kind of hyper-spirituality where these people would try to induce their own mystical spiritual experiences and then they would brag about these visions to other people. Paul says that these visions are just made up, puffed up idle notions that come from an unspiritual mind, but the Colossians would naturally want to experience anything that God had promised to them through Christ, and this group was saying, well, if you follow Jesus, you'll have visions. And finally, this group promised that these rules would give the Colossian Christians victory over their sinful impulses. Victory over their sinful impulses. And we see this in verse 23, the last verse of our reading. And the translation in verse 23, sensual indulgence, is a little misleading because the word there can describe any kind of desire. The the New Revised Standard translates it self-indulgence, which I think is a little more accurate. And the Colossian Christians have probably developed a lot of sinful habits over a lifetime of not knowing God. Habits related to lying and resentment 
jealousy and envy, lust, bitterness, gluttony, gossip. And they were surrounded by constant temptations to fall back into their old habits. And along comes this group promising that if they followed this group's rules, the Colossian Christians would have victory over these sinful habits. Of course it would be appealing. But Paul condemns this entire system as wrong. Earlier in the chapter, he called it a hollow and empty philosophy. Paul wants us to know that Jesus is enough and that under Christ's lordship, we have all we need to live the Christian life. Let's consider how Paul responds to these ideas. Paul is going to say that, Paul says that our faith in Jesus and our baptism in Jesus, we already have everything that the Old Testament foreshadowed. We already have all that. Verse 17, Paul calls the Jewish calendar and the Jewish food laws of clean and unclean shadows. Submitting to these rules is like living in the shadow lands. It's like going back in time to life before Jesus came into the world. Why would anyone want to do that? The substance belongs to Christ. He is the one that the shadows were all pointing towards. And just as we saw last week, that Christian baptism is the fulfillment of Jewish circumcision, all of these other laws and requirements are fully fulfilled in Jesus. Why live in the shadowlands when the light has come? Also, through faith in Jesus and baptism, we already belong to the people of God. We already belong. Verse 19, Paul says that God's people is like a body. Jesus is the head the source of the body's life. And when we trust in Jesus and are baptized, it's like our life is an organ transplant into this body. And we fully belong now in this body, held in place along with all the other members of the body by ligaments and tendons. And in this body, Christ, the head, gives us everything we need to flourish and grow and those who live in the shadows lose their connection with the head, the source of life. We are, we've already died to the dominion of sin and evil through our faith in baptism. Our baptismal identification with Jesus enacts a very real death to sin and to the spiritual forces of evil in our world. We're no longer ensnared and held captive by sin. We can choose to obey God, and there'll be more about this in chapter 3. And finally, we've already risen with Christ to new life. We've already risen. And this will be the focus of Colossians chapters 3 and 4 that will begin next week. We already saw this earlier in this chapter in verse 12 when Paul says that in baptism we are raised with Christ. So let's sum up our mirror reading today. A group of Jewish Christians was stirring up big trouble in the Colossian church by insisting that the Colossians obey their list of rules, their do's and don'ts. And this group was judging the Colossian church's faith as deficient and excluding Colossian Christians from being fully members of the people of God because they weren't keeping these rules. This group further promised that their rules would ensure that the Colossians were truly part of God's people, that they would give them mystical, spiritual experiences that they could brag about, and that they would give them victory over the sinful habits that they were struggling with. But Paul calls the Colossians back to Jesus, back to faith in Him and their baptism. So let me close with, in just a couple of minutes with a couple of very brief applications. First, under Christ's lordship, we are free from other people's subjective judgments. We are free. As my three initial stories demonstrate, Christians today still sometimes turn their preferences into rules that they use as boundary markers to try to determine who's in and who's out. 
Do not let other Christians judge you or disqualify you because you don't follow their arbitrary rules or meet their self-made expectations about what a real Christian should look like. And this is not to say that there aren't important ethical teachings in the Bible we should obey, because there are. We'll begin looking at some of them next week. But when people turn their preferences and convictions into rules that they use to judge you, do not be held captive to that judgment. Be free to be the person God has made you to be. Second, under Christ's lordship, we are free to fully belong to God's people. Not only are we free to be ourselves, we're free to fully belong. There are no second-class members in the body of Christ. And we may not all have the same function in the body, but each member of the body is essential. And if you've trusted in Jesus and been baptized, you belong. Finally, under Christ's lordship, we are free to progress in our own spiritual transformation. We're free to grow. We are connected to the head, held secure there by tendons and ligaments. And from Jesus, we receive all the nourishment and strength and support we need to go grow as God causes us to grow. We don't cause our own spiritual transformation by adhering to a list of do's and don'ts. We grow as God causes the growth. And this is not only true of us individually, it's true of us as a church. Glenn Kirk doesn't grow because I make it grow, or the staff makes it grow, or the elders make it grow, or the members make it grow. God is the one who causes the growth. And our role is to stay connected to Jesus. Living under the Lordship of Christ means being free. Free to be who we are as God made us. Free to fully belong to His people. And free to grow as God causes. Let's pray together. Father, even today, there are those that would seek to take us captive to preferences and convictions, many of them wise in moderation, but legalistic and killing when turned into rules. Father, help us be people who live in freedom that we are no longer slaves, no longer captive to the things of this world and even to the things that other Christians make up and try to push on us. God, we love you and we pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.